Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, family and friends on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I want to welcome you to the ever increasing world feast, and I'm excited today to have all of you connected to this broadcast. Abel Damina is my name. We are very committed to the vision of reintroducing Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. Do me the favor today, invite somebody, share this video, tag somebody, you know, create watch parties, let's flood the entire Blue Marble planet with the fragrance of Jesus' grace. And I want you to know we're going to have an exciting time of studying the word of his grace on this particular broadcast today. Let me quickly mention that my two books are out. And if you don't have a copy of these books, I don't know what you're waiting for. Causes, Myth and the Truth. Very powerful material. You know, in this book, I talked about the language in which the Bible was written, use of words, the role of the Bible reader and the Bible teacher. The blessing and the curse, does God curse? The curse of the law, what of generational curses? Jesus and the fig tree and a lot more. It's a book you don't want to, you know, uh, go without, especially for people that have been threatened with curses before now. You know, what you don't know is bigger than you. Ignorance is the greatest undoing of any man. My people are destroyed not because Satan is powerful, but because they don't know. They have no knowledge. So get this material today. It will build you up and edify you and bring clarity. Then there's this other book on the communion table. Many people ask me so many questions on the communion, you know, and all of that. This book is very powerful. I wrote this book and there's a lot in it. Exegesis all over the book. The promise of God, the Old Testament feast, the difference between the Passover, breaking of bread, and the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, and walking in love. Very powerful material. I'd like you to order for them, you know, and all other books that we have written. All of these efforts is to see that you are enriched in your work with Christ, that you maximize everything that Christ has provided for your spiritual edification. I'd like you to share with other people, you know, the things we are sharing with you here. Get more people to be connected. Get more people to order for the material. Right now on the screen, the phone number to call for the material is on the screen and the email address where you can send your orders to is also on the screen. There are also many other titles. I have written over 30 titles you can order and our office can send you all of the catalogs for it. Now, let me also mention, those of you that have been following my teachings who don't have a local church where you attend, where Christ is revealed, God wants you to live among brethren. God doesn't want you to be isolated. The Bible says God has placed the solitary in families. The word of God tells you, I will bring you to your fold and I will give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And he says, it shall come to pass that when you are fed, you shall not lack, you shall not fear, you shall not be dismayed. If you are in a location where there's no Bible teaching church, where Christ is revealed all the time, you've been following my teachings and you want to identify with one or you want to start a campus. We call our churches campuses. You want to start a campus. All you need to do is send me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. We will equip you and train you and work together with you to create a campus in your locality so you become a lighthouse where other people seeking to know Christ can come around and be part of the fellowship and you can be pioneering a church there that will bring light to that community. You become a lighthouse in that society. I'm really excited about the opportunity God has given us as a ministry to enrich and equip believers all over the nations of the earth. Just before we go into the service, remember again that you need a pen, a notebook, and a Bible because it's going to be an exciting adventure as we adventure together into the word of his grace. My prayer for you today is that grace abound towards you, that you always have sufficiency in all things. You abound unto every good work in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me mention, the study we're going to be having the next one, two weeks here on 
Facebook, YouTube every evening at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. The study we're going to be having is going to be a Bible school. We want to equip you and train you in the pursuit of the kingdom assignment that God has for your life. I want to encourage you every day at this same time, 10 p.m. GMT plus one to get more people to be part of this broadcast so together we can lighten the dark places of the earth. Let me take you on a gospel adventure right now into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We're starting a journey tonight. I hope you have your barrels and notebooks. We're going to explore the book of Galatians, understanding the book of Galatians. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word actually means in the beginning was the reason, the thought, the essence. Or in other words, in the beginning was the explanation of all things. In John chapter 1 verse 14, it says, That word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word became flesh and dwelt among us. Which word? The explanation of all things. The word is the explanation of all things, meaning that the explanation of scripture is in a person. The explanation of scripture is in a person. Through that person, the scriptures make sense to us. The explanation of the scriptures are in a person. Through that person, the scriptures make sense to us. Let me just give you an illustration to help you understand what I just said. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 to 6, talking about the correction of the law. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Next verse. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And we've already said that, you know, in the Old Testament, you won't see the word scourge from where this scripture was made reference to. Now, you know, some people believe that the chastening of the Lord has to be with the Lord trying to teach you a lesson through sickness or trying to teach you a lesson through poverty or trying to teach you a lesson through hard times. You see some believers, when they are going through hard moments, they will say, the Lord is trying to get my attention. That must be some cruel father. Sometimes believers are going through a very bad situation with health. Their health is under heavy attack. They say, I'm sure the Lord is trying to teach me a lesson, to teach me how to calm down, how to meditate, and how to study. So they paint a picture of God as a cruel master, you know, um, meaning that they do not believe the words of Jesus. Because if you believe that everything that God says in the scripture is explained in Christ, then you will not think of sickness as God teaching you a lesson. You won't think of poverty as God teaching you a lesson. So in order for us to understand a little bit of that and decipher that scripture we just read, we have to go back to the gospels and see the modus operandi of Jesus. Jesus speaking in the gospel says, he that has seen me has seen the father. Meaning, I am the exclusive revealer of the father or I am the father made manifest. Or, I give expression to the character of the Father. Meaning, if you cannot see Jesus, you cannot see the Father. And if you don't know Jesus, you cannot know the Father. He says, I am the way. No man can go to the Father except by me. He's not talking about road of travel. He was talking about nobody can access the revelation or the unveiling of the Father except I am unveiled to him. Again, Jesus is the explanation of the scriptures or the scriptures are explained in a person. The person of the Christ explains the scriptures to us. So let's watch this. How did Jesus rebuke people when he was on earth? He didn't rebuke people with sickness. He didn't rebuke people with disease. He rebuked people with words. With words. So the chastening of the Lord will be with words. He never stormed anybody with, with a fever to teach him a lesson. Jesus never destroyed somebody with poverty to teach him a lesson. 
He expresses the Father to us. He reveals the Father to us. And the Bible tells us he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So if Jesus reveals the Father to us and Jesus never got anybody rebuked by sickness, disease, or poverty or going through a hard time, then the Father certainly does not rebuke people by sickness, poverty, disease, and tough times. How did Jesus rebuke people? He rebuked people with words, for example. You know, he said to Peter, let us go over to the other side. The instruction was, let us go over to the other side. The instruction was, let us go over to the other side. When they were on their way to the other side, there was a great storm of wind and, you know, it was boisterous. And Jesus was sleeping. And Peter walked to Jesus and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He didn't rebuke Peter. He just did that first of all. First of all, he rebuked the wind and the waves. He took care of the problem. Then he now said to them, why did you doubt? I mean, look at Peter walking in the water. Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, if you are the one master, bid me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. That's exactly why I'm walking to show you what potentials you have. So Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water. And then he began to sink. Jesus didn't stand to say, I have been warning you, Peter. You mean all the teachings I have taught you, you couldn't even walk on the water? While rebuking Peter, Peter will be drinking water. Peter will be dead. Because while he is trying to scorch Peter, he will destroy Peter. But what did Jesus do? When Peter started sinking, he moved to him and grabbed him. He first of all helped him. Then when he has rescued him, while they were walking back to the water, I said, why did you doubt? That means God does not look for how to get you at a point of advantage to teach you a lesson. In fact, if you get into a point of advantage, he comes to your rescue first before using words to rebuke you. I'm teaching here. So Jesus explains the father to us. Jesus reveals the father to us. And if you're watching or you're in the service, you've always thought that God will use calamities to teach you a lesson. Well, you were misled. Actually, somebody uh, defrauded you. Somebody carried out a fraud on your person. Because God does not use Satan's equipment to instruct his children. He uses words to instruct his children. If you understand that, can I hear your good amen? And he does not rebuke you only with words. He rebukes you with words in love. He rebukes you with words in love. For example, Peter is doubting him. But first of all, he comes to his rescue. That is love. Then after rescuing him, as they walk together, he now rebukes him with words. He could have allowed him to drink the water as a rebuke. But that is not in him. It's not his nature. Somebody said, well, God sent a tornado to destroy the city. Because there are a lot of homosexuals in the city. And there are a lot of drunkards in the city. That is not consistent with the character of God. Because even Sodom and Gomorrah that was given to a lot of adultery and immorality, God still gave them a chance. Even on the day of destruction, he still gave them a chance. The angels came to give them good message, to give them the message. But they rejected Christ. And Sodom and Gomorrah was a typology of the end of the world. That if you reject Christ, then you will be consumed. The ark of Noah was a typology of the end of the world. That if you refuse to enter the ark, you refuse to accept the message of salvation. When the ark is closed, when the world ends, then you will have to be swallowed by the flood. These are all typologies of the end of time revealing what happens to people who reject the gospel. I don't know if I'm communicating here. So Jesus explains to us the scriptures. Or the scriptures are explained in Christ. I didn't hear somebody shout hallelujah. I didn't hear somebody shout hallelujah. So the Bible is explained in a person. To be able to understand the Bible, you must look at the Bible in a person. John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. In them you think. Because in them you don't have eternal life. Eternal life is not in the scriptures. Eternal life is in a person. Eternal life is not in the scriptures. Eternal life is in a person. But the scriptures testify of the person. 
The scriptures testify of the person. But eternal life is not in the scriptures. Eternal life is in the person. I don't know if I'm communicating here. Because verse 40 of that John 5 says, And you will not come to me, the person, that you might have life. Life is not in the scriptures. Life is in a person. The scriptures cannot give life. Only Jesus gives life. Jesus is life. The book of 1 John chapter 5 verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him. The Son of God has come to give us an understanding that we may know him. That is true. And we are in him that is true. Who is this him? Even in his son, Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? This is the true God. Who is the true God? And eternal life. So Jesus is the true God and Jesus is eternal life. So when we say you have received eternal life, what do we mean? You have received Jesus. What do we mean? You have received the true God. I don't know if I'm communicating. Jesus is the true God. Jesus is eternal life. Eternal life is Jesus. The true God is Jesus. To receive Jesus is to receive the true God. To understand Jesus is to understand the true God. To understand Jesus is to understand eternal life. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only through God. So who is the only through God? Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus Christ is the only through God. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the true God. You can know religion, you can know about God. But you cannot know God till you know Jesus. No man can come to the Father but by me. Why? He is life eternal. This is life eternal. That they may know you. So eternal life is a person. Eternal life is a person. When we say you have received eternal life. What we mean is that God or Jesus or eternal life. The same thing has walked into you. He that has the son has life. Life is in the son. Life is not in the scriptures. But the scriptures reveal to us the son. Very important. So knowing the scriptures and quoting the scriptures doesn't give life. That you memorize scriptures and you can quote scriptures doesn't give life. The life that the scriptures testify of can only be experienced in a person. I'm teaching here. The life that the scriptures testify of can only be experienced in a person. So life is in a person. And the essence of the entire document called the scriptures is the revelation of Jesus. The essence of the entire book called the scriptures is the revelation of Jesus. That's why he said they are they, the scriptures which testify of me. If you're with me, shout I hear you. I say if you're with me, shout I hear you. In Luke chapter 24 verse 27 if all you're doing is to study the Bible so you can know the Bible you are in an academic pursuit. If all you are doing is to study the Bible so you can know the Bible, you are you and a theologian who doesn't know Jesus are the same. Your study of the Bible is not for just head knowledge. Your study of the Bible is to unveil God to you so you and God can have a more effective relationship. That's the essence. The essence of teaching, the essence of study is so that God can be unveiled. Because the more you know God, the more effective you are in your relationship. Many can't pray because they don't know Jesus. So they are praying to the unknown God. When you are praying to the unknown God, how can you pray? How? You have to know him. 
I know the riches that uh, he has provided in knowing him. Praise God. Oh, I say praise God. Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses, of course we know the story. On the way to Emmaus, he met this gentleman who were disciples of his, who were discussing about his death and burial. And they were talking to Jesus. Jesus called them fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. To cure them of that kind of foolishness beginning at Moses. Of course, you know Moses is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The things in the scriptures, what makes the scriptures scriptures are the things concerning him. Why? The scriptures are explained in a person or Jesus is the explanation of the scriptures. Please, this is very important. He said the scriptures, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He is the message of the scriptures. So hence we say that the Bible is a Christocentric material. He took them through the whole Old Testament. Because when he was expounding to them in all the scriptures, there was no Luke. There was no New Testament. So where he expounded to them was Genesis to Malachi. And he said, Genesis to Malachi, testify of me. And then to prove that, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Old Testament, he expounded unto them in all Genesis to Malachi, the things concerning himself. Are you still here? I said, are you still here? So pay attention. The understanding of the scriptures, therefore, the scriptures are understood, therefore, when they are pointing to Jesus. The understanding of the scriptures is when the scriptures are taught in a way where they point to Jesus. Anything outside that will leave you in limbo. It will leave you in confusion. In that Luke chapter 24, look at what happened to them in verse 43. And he took it and did it before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. Which were written where? In the law of Moses and where? And in the prophets and where? And in the Psalms. How? Concerning me. Concerning me. Then, next verse. Open he their understanding. That they might understand the scriptures. When you see Jesus. Your understanding opens. To understand the scriptures. That testify of him. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. No wonder Paul said to his son Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That word known is the word acquaint. To acquaint yourself or to be a friend of something. To know something, to be acquainted, or to be a friend, or to be familiar with something. You have known, you have been acquainted with the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Next verse. Knowing this first. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The word private interpretation there means private origin or private source. That's to say no prophet prophesied from what he felt or what he taught. All prophets pulled out their prophecy from the same container. All the Old Testament prophets pulled out their prophecy from the same container. That means their prophecy is the same. No private origin. Nobody prophesied from his own private source. 
All of them prophesied from a collective source. Meaning that if you go through all their prophecies, it is saying the same thing in different forms. Are we together here? No prophecy of the scripture. Of the scripture. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private source, origin. So the scriptures have one origin. The scriptures have one origin. Referring to the singularity of the scriptures. Or the singularity of the mind of the scriptures. Referring to the singularity of the mind of the scriptures. That no scripture is of any private interpretation. Look at verse 21. For the prophecy. Somebody said the prophecy. He didn't say for prophecy. He said for the prophecy. For the prophecy. Not for prophecy. Meaning a particular class of prophecy. Talking about the prophecy of the scripture. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Meaning no man just stood up and prophesied what he thought. It didn't originate from an individual's opinion. When it comes to the scripture, you don't have an opinion. Please listen carefully. That's why the scripture must interpret itself. You don't have an opinion. You rightly divide it. Let it interpret itself. Why? The Bible will never mean today what it never meant when it was written. The Bible can never mean today what it never meant when it was written. That's why it is of no private interpretation. It was not a circumstantial prophecy. It was not a man's opinion. It was not the will of a man. All the prophets pulled out their prophecy from the same origin. Because all of them were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm teaching here. Please, if you are with me, say I hear you. That's why the scripture has no respect for persons. And it has no respect for situations. We don't subject the Bible to fit your situation. No. We don't preach circumstantial messages. We give you doctrine. When you are established in doctrine, from a doctrinal position, you handle situations. We don't neutralize the potency of scripture to become circumstantial. No, no, no. We give you the mind of God as revealed in Christ. When you receive that and you see yourself in Christ, then any situation notwithstanding, whether we label them or not, you can handle it in Christ. So what we give you is doctrine. What we give you is doctrine. We don't give you motivation. We don't teach you entrepreneurship. We don't teach you how to survive recession. Those are circumstantial messages. We reveal Christ to you. When you see yourself in Christ, recession will obey you. Metola do bada. Krindangongolu da gagas. Hila badagaya. No scripture is of any private interpretation. Therefore, the scriptures cannot be subjected to the will of a man because they never originated from man. But they came from the same origin. Holy men spake as all of them were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look at it now. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So all of them Spoke from the Holy Ghost. Hegebado. All of them did what? Spoke from where? From the Holy Ghost. And you know the Holy Ghost has one mission. To reveal Jesus. So all of them spoke the revelation of Jesus. As enabled by the Holy Ghost. This is very important. You understand this more. When you look at First Peter chapter 1 verse 10. 
of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They were searching. That's why the prophecy didn't come from their will. If the prophecy came from their will, they wouldn't search. They would have been prophesying what they know. But because it was not originated from men, after they prophesied it, they had to search. Because this is not coming from me. And I don't understand what I'm saying. It doesn't make sense to me. All the prophets. Look at it. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified beforehand. What was the testimony of the spirit? The sufferings of Christ. So elato melita. The content and context of their prophecy is summarized in the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. There are two basic things about Christ. He will suffer and out of his suffering, glory will follow. And that is what thread runs through the book called the scriptures. It runs through the prophecy of the prophets. So the entire Bible is Christ-centered. It's Christocentric. The Bible is not a teaching on ideas for technology. We are not here to give you We are not here to give you ideas for technology. The Bible is not for business entrepreneurship. Agricultural revolution. No, that is far from the scriptures. The scriptures are centered on a person. So for our study of Galatians, we already have a foundation. We already have a foundation for our study of Galatians. Now, to further show you what this foundation is, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is a person. It's not the shrine in your village. The foundation is a person. It's not the deity that your village worships, which some people have used in the name of deliverance to perpetually keep Christians in bondage ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The foundation is a person. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is already laid. We are not trying to lay foundation for you. The foundation has been laid and the foundation is a person. What is his name? Jesus Christ. So if you are in Christ, where are you? You are already on a laid foundation. So anybody asking you to go to the village to break the foundation is insulting your saintly dignity. Did you hear that? Anybody asking you to go to the village to break a foundation in the village is insulting what? Your saintly dignity. There's only one foundation. Jesus Christ. And it has already been laid. It is not going to be laid. So when you came into Christ, you came into an already, an already structured, laid foundation. Are you in the foundation? Yes. And what kind of foundation? Sure foundation. What kind of foundation? Sure foundation. The believer in Christ is not in a dilemma at all. His case was settled before he came into it. His life was fixed before he came in. It's a blessing to know Jesus. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ is the foundation of all preaching and teaching. Jesus Christ. You are not the foundation of all preaching and teaching. Jesus is the foundation. We don't target our messages on you. Our message is Christ. When you see Christ, 
Christ reflects in you. Revelation 19, 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. His name is called what? The word of God. That same revelation says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. Meaning that Jesus is the explanation of all things. That's to say all prophecy kibatana, that came from the prophets. All prophecy that came from the prophets originated out of the testimony of Jesus. The message of Jesus is what forms the prophecy of the prophets. The message of Christ is what forms the prophecy of the prophets. Whether major prophets or minor prophets for the establishing that the Bible is Jesus' book. It's a Christocentric material. The Bible is a Christocentric material. When you read the Bible and you don't see Jesus, you didn't read, go back and read. Because Christ is the explanation of all things. Look at Philip in Samaria. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached what? What was his message? What was his message? He preached Christ. And after preaching Christ, while he was yet celebrating miracles that happened, because when Christ is preached, he takes care of everything. All things were made by him. While miracles were happening, the spirit said to Philip, join the chariot. When he joined that chariot, he found out that the guy in the chariot was a minister of finance, a rich guy, and he was reading from the book of Isaiah. Where the Bible says he was laid as a dumb before he shared us. And he opened out his mouth. And as Philip joined the chariot and met the man reading, Philip asked the man a billion dollar question. Understandest thou what thou readest? There are many reading the Bible and cannot explain what they are reading because they are not reading it Christocentrically, if there's English like that. They are reading to look for solution to problem. That's not the essence of the Bible. The essence of the Bible is to unveil Christ. So if you're looking for Christ, you will find him. Then when you find him, you know what to do with problems. It's not problems first. It's Christ first. Jesus is not afraid of problems. So get him first. When you get him, you form a team. But seek him first. And what will happen? And all is righteous. Then what will happen? These things are not in None of these things can measure to the value of Christ. Hey. Hey, nothing can compare. There's nowhere to even begin the comparison from. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Philip asked him, understandest thou what thou readest? And the man said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. Then the Bible says, I'm beginning from the same scripture. Philip didn't start from another one. That means Philip was so, so sound in the scriptures that anywhere you are reading from, if Philip finds you, he will start from there to explain Christ. Because the whole Bible is Jesus' book. Anywhere, if a man is reading about the sacrifices in Leviticus, the turtle doves, the pigeon, if that's where you find him, you start from the pigeon and the turtle dove to preach Christ. Because both the turtle doves and the pigeons were all concerning Christ. The tabernacle, all of them were Christ. Joseph in the Old Testament was a type of Jesus in manifestation, in parable. That Joseph's story. Joseph's story was Jesus' story in parables. Who was Joseph? The beloved of the father. Who is Jesus? The beloved of the father. What happened to Joseph? His brothers rejected him. What happened to Jesus? He came unto his own and his own received him not. What happened to Joseph? He was sold a slave. What of Jesus? The father gave him up. 
What happened to Joseph? Joseph in slavery was interpreting dreams. What happened to Jesus? He was interpreting all our dreams in redemption. What happened to Joseph? Joseph the interpreting dreams became the prime minister. Second in command. In fact, Pharaoh said, in this throne, I am just figurehead. It is you that will actually operate the throne. What happened to Jesus? Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, so, 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 so Joseph was a type of Jesus. But you see, if you don't have a Christocentric understanding, you will be reading Joseph's story and feeling sorry. But no, no, no. It was prophecy in dramatization. I don't know if I'm teaching to somebody. He says, they are there which testify of me. I can go on and on. The Bible is Jesus' book. Beginning from that scripture, Philip explained Christ to the man. That's true Bible study. To be able to start from anywhere and preach Christ. That's true Bible study. Jesus is the light. He's the life. He's the essence. He's the message of the scriptures. Keep at Anaga. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1. We are still trying to study Galatians. We are still trying to set the runway for the takeoff. Are you still in the house? Yes. And I brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom. I didn't come with motivation. I didn't come with the skills of public speaking. He said, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I didn't come with human wisdom. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. I didn't use any natural acquired university skills and degree to unveil Christ. But watch this. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you. I don't want to know what you studied in the university. I don't want to know if you're a graduate of Harvard. I don't want to know if you graduated from which one again? Cambridge? No, 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 no. I don't want to know the car you drove when you were coming to the service. I don't want to know whether you are the governor of a state or you are a federal minister. All those things don't matter when Jesus shows up. All that you think you are in the face of Jesus is nothing. So I determined to know nothing among you. Save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that is the message. A man that is not revealing Christ to you is wasting your time. He's just wasting your time and resources. There's no need to sit under any man that cannot unveil Christ to you. He's not what you are reading. He's not even what your attention. There's no need because he's just making caricature of your time. If he cannot reveal Christ, he means he doesn't know the book. And if he doesn't know the book, why sit down under a quack? A quack. Just like you have quack doctors. When a quack doctor works on you, he will, you will have to be worked upon. If you are lucky. If you are not lucky, before they will work on you, you will kick the bucket. You know what kicking the bucket is? How did they kick the bucket? They cross over. Just like that. Why sit under a quack person? Why? That's why a man of God must, must be sound in word and doctrine. He must. If he doesn't, don't let him use you for experiment. You are not a, a guinea pig. You are precious before God. You sit under a man that will open the book and show you Jesus. Because that's the essence of preaching. And that's the essence of what? teaching. Every time you come here I and Jesus have a covenant with each other. We have an agreement that my responsibility is to reveal him to you. No matter which subject of scripture we study it will be Christocentric. Say I hear you. Beginning at where the eunuch was preaching what did Philip preach to him? Christ. It doesn't matter where he was reading from. It doesn't matter where he was reading from. It doesn't matter where he was running from. It doesn't matter where he was reading from. The message is a person. The message is not politics. The message is not governance. We teach you Christ and you in him. We preach not ourselves. 
but Christ. That's what we preach. We don't preach ourselves. We preach not ourselves. We are not the message. He is the message. Anybody preaching himself is trying to push Jesus out of the way and be your Jesus. And he doesn't have the juice. He fit it. And he cut it. We preach not ourselves. Did my blood save a fly? Can I even be able to save a hell of my head? Why will I preach me? There's nothing to preach about me. There's nothing to preach about me. There's everything to preach about him. Here's a message. Glory to God. It's all about Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody shout nothing about me. All about him. So because you are in him, when we study the Bible, you see yourself in him. Because the scriptures testify of him. Now are you ready? Galatians chapter 1 verse 1. Now just before I read it, keep it there. Most of the ignorance that we have today in the church world, number one is how people understand or misunderstand the Pauline epistles. That's the first problem in the church world. How people understand or misunderstand the Pauline epistles. That's the first problem. Sometimes I get, I get baffled when I hear a preacher preach a whole one hour. Not one epistle is read. For a whole one hour, not even one of the epistles, not even by mistake, do you hear an epistle mention? And he's preaching to believers. I wonder what he's doing. Shouldn't we preach from the Old Testament? It's too light. The Old Testament is too light because they are just portions of truth. Portions of truth scattered here and there. The concentrated truth is the epistles. Say I hear you. So it's one of the major ignorance in the body of Christ today is either the understanding of the Pauline epistles or the misunderstanding of that. Number two, the Pauline epistles unlock the scriptures to us. The scriptures cannot be unlocked outside the Pauline epistles. Number three, the Pauline epistles unlocks the mystery of the scriptures. It unlocks the mysteries of the scriptures. So when you don't understand the Pauline epistles, you will never understand the Bible. That's why many people are fighting brother Paul. They fight his teachings. But what did Jesus say himself? On the last public teaching of Jesus, the last day Jesus did a teaching public. What did Jesus say in John chapter 16? Because that was Jesus' last public lecture. John 16 verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you. But you cannot bear them now. That means what I want to say, I have not said it. Because you lack the capacity to carry it. The next verse. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all the truth. All the truth. All the truth. So the epistles are all the truth concerning Jesus revealed. All. Genesis to Malachi, portion, portion, portion of the truth. The epistles, all the truth. Teaching good here. Yeah. The epistles gives you the body of truth, all the truth. Gives you the totality of truth. Because the epistles unveils a person to us in his full glory. It unveils Jesus in his full glory. The words of Jesus in the four gospels cannot give you complete revelation. He said, I have yet many things. That's, I didn't say the things I want. So you can't find complete revelation in the teachings of Jesus in the gospels. But in the epistles is where you find it. Watch this. In the gospels you hear Jesus say, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow. Have you read that? In the gospels. When you come to an epistle, you will never hear him asking you to take up his, your cross. In the epistles, he took the cross on your behalf. So that one he was telling you to take. 
was incomplete because the real person that will take the cross is himself. When he took the cross, he took it on your behalf. So you don't have the cross to carry anymore because he has carried the cross on your behalf. And when you are in him, you and him carried it together. I'm teaching here. I met a pastor in Ghana, bless his heart. Great man of God, came in from America. Great man. Been in ministry for years. Sat down to listen to me. He was also a guest speaker. He decided that he must listen to me. The first day I entered there and I opened fire on the revelation of Jesus. Hey, the thing was coming from every direction. Sometimes the thing is too much. I don't even know whether to use my fingers to dispense it or my legs. The thing will just confuse. It was heavy. When we finished, he asked for all my nine books that night. All my nine books. He bought it. The whole nine books. He bought it and said, anybody that can reveal Jesus like this must know what he's talking about. He bought my nine books. He bought it on Friday evening. By Sunday evening, when he came to hear me preach my last message, he said, I have finished reading the whole nine books. He said, sleep left my eyes. From that Friday, I have not closed my eye. I made up my mind. I must empty everything you have put in the books. He said, I have read all the nine books and I'm carrying them to America. I will be reading them and teaching it in my church. Some of you have not read two of it. <laughs> Taking things for granted, right? The man finished all the nine books in three days. He said, I've read. He said, he said look, Dr. Damida, the illiteracy in the body of Christ is a lack of understanding the epistles. I told him, you are correct. I told him, you are absolutely correct. But we shared fellowship. It was a beautiful time. When people don't understand the epistles, they begin to fight with themselves. Look at it. Peter said it. Brother Peter. He said it in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Put it up. He said, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Brother Paul had a wisdom with which he wrote, which none of us have. Peter, who was with Jesus physically, submitted to Paul. He said, our beloved brother Paul, he spoke things by the wisdom given to him. And we respect that wisdom and we bow to that wisdom. Then look at Peter's acknowledgement of Paul's teaching. As also in all epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things, even Peter acknowledged that some things that Paul thought are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures but this is unto their own destruction so they wrestle with these things they wrestle with these things they fight ignorantly Galatians 1 1 hey I love brother Paul when I get to heaven I will shake him and give him knuckle I'll tell him, chop knuckle, brother Paul. You, you, chop knuckle, chop knuckle. Paul, <laughs> an apostle. I like the way he, he started it. Don't you like that? Paul, an apostle. Then he now give it a qualifier. Not of men. Meaning, nobody ordained me. <laughs> Meaning, nobody called me and said, you are an apostle. Meaning, my apostleship is not a title. Can I talk to somebody here? Neither by man. Meaning nobody ordained me. Nobody gave me the title of an apostle. But this is how it came. But by Jesus Christ. And God the Father. Or Jesus Christ. Which is God the Father. Who raised him from the dead. <laughs> what Paul is submitting here. Number one is that you don't ordain an apostle. You can ordain bishops. You can ordain deacons. You can ordain elders. But you don't ordain apostles. You don't ordain prophets. You don't ordain pastors, teachers, and evangelists. These are offices which Jesus has given. He that descended, the seed that ascended. And when he ascended, what did he do? 
he gave gifts. And what are the gifts? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastoring teachers. He gave them. You don't ordain them. They are given. But the church can recognize them. Okay? In a consecration service where we say we recognize that you are set apart as a gift to the body of Christ. But we don't ordain them. Their ordination is from Jesus himself. But bishops can be ordained. Elders can be ordained. Okay? Deacons can be ordained. But you don't ordain the fivefold ministry. So Paul is beginning to show you something here. Somebody in the house. I said, somebody in the house. Yeah, we recognize the fivefold ministry. He said, ordain not of men. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we see a service taking place. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereon I have called them. Say, I have already ordained them. I have already called them. Your job is just to separate them. You are not the ones calling them. I have called them. You just separate them, pray for them, and release them to their assignment. I have already called them. Next verse. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. In Acts chapter 6, verse 2 to 4, they set apart deacons and they ordained them. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is no reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenes, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set forth before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. That's ordination. Deacons were ordained. But pastors, apostles, prophets, teachers are a gift from Jesus. They are a gift from Jesus to the body of Christ. You can pray for them, set them apart. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 6, Wherefore I put in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. 1 Timothy 4 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. You can pray for them and release them to the work. Because the call didn't come by ordination, it came from Jesus Christ. It's not of men. No man called these fivefold offices. They are office gifts given to the body of Christ by Jesus as one of the benefits of his resurrection. Because it's when he ascended that he gave the gift. It's Jesus that gave it. I'm teaching here. I said, I'm teaching here. So an apostle, not of men, but by Jesus Christ. Verse 2 of Galatians 1. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. All the brethren. You know, yeah, sometimes people say, Paul is an apostle sent to the Gentiles. Peter is an apostle sent to the Jews. Let's be careful how we copy statements. We have to do a doctrinal search before we own statements. You don't just... It doesn't matter who said it. doesn't make it authentic. Check if it is in Jesus. Check the scriptures to see if that statement is in Jesus. If it agrees with Jesus. If not, don't say it. So. Amen. So let's look at the call of Paul. Let's see whether Paul was really truly sent to the Gentiles. Amen. Acts 9, 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me do? 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Verse 15 of Acts 9. Now this is when Paul met Ananias. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children. So Paul was to bear the name before Gentiles, before kings, before the children. So he wasn't sent to the Gentiles alone. He was sent to everybody. Kings, Gentiles, the children of Israel. See that is from the call. That is from the call. Now Paul was narrating his vision himself. This is Ananias narrating it. Now Paul is talking about it himself before the king. In Acts 26, 13, look at the way Paul said it to Agrippa. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick your legs against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Delivering thee from the people. One, two. From the Gentiles. In the New Testament, where you see the word people, he means Jews. So, Paul himself said, when Jesus appeared to me, he said, I am delivering you from the people. And from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send you to the people and I send you to the Gentiles. Are you here? Okay. Praise the Lord. And then verse 18. To open their eyes and to bring them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul wasn't sent exclusively to non-Jews. All his materials can be read by Jews and non-Jews. How many of you know in Mark chapter 16 verse 15 the commission is not to Jews or Gentiles. Go into all the world. Matthew 28, go into all the world make disciples of all nations. In fact, if you read Acts 13, every city Paul went to, first of all, he went to the Jews. After preaching to the Jews, he now went to the Gentiles. Every city he went to. Every city he went to. Because that was his call. To bring the message of Jesus Christ to all of humanity. Not just a selected. So, there's no special message for Jews. And there's no special message for Gentiles. The message is one. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I didn't hear your amen. I said the message is how many? The message is one. When Paul enters a city, he will go to the Gentiles. He will go to the Jews first. Then he will go to the Gentiles. Most of the places where Paul went. The reason is because the message is one. The actor is one. The mission is one. To reveal Christ. The entire Bible is tied in one message. Christ. Every prophet's book became part of the Bible because when it was studied, it was in line, in agreement with all the other writings. That's why when Jesus will teach, he will be saying, Moses said about me. David said about me. He was confirming that all of them were prophets pointing to him. Like I always say, Jesus is not God's messenger. Jesus is the message. And when you get the message of the Christ, you understand salvation. When you understand salvation, you understand who you are. When you understand who you are in him, you can say, I am complete in him. Who is the head, the pleroma, the corporate headquarters of the Godhead bodily? Who is complete in Christ here? Can you stand on your feet and shout, I am complete in him? Can I hear you shouting very loud? Shout it like you know what you're talking about. Say, in him there is no sickness. In him there is no poverty. In him there is no disease. 
In him there is no failure. I am complete in him. Therefore, no disease, no poverty, no failure is permitted in my territory. I thought you would shout a good amen. amen. Now say, I resist, I resist Satan, Satan, his cohorts, and every setup of the kingdom of darkness. I resist you. It is written, when I resist, you will flee right now. I resist poverty. I resist sickness. I resist frustration. I resist stagnation. And I declare that always Jesus causes me to triumph. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Say the remaining days of my life, I will live a triumphant life. In Christ, I have no lack. I have no need. In Christ, I am complete. In Christ, I have all of his perfection. In Christ, I am blessed beyond measure. In Christ, I am favored. Favored by God. I cannot be denied by men. I am accepted in the beloved. Therefore, therefore, wherever I am found, the virgins love me. I didn't hear your amen. And I prophesy to the first 500 of you whose amen will come like thunder. Swim in favor. Swim in favor. Swim in favor. Swim in favor. By the favor of God, I decree your mountain is standing strong. Every need is met according to his riches in glory. I command that glory inside you to flow out of you and meet your needs. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Infirmity, go. Disease, melt. Disease, melt. Disease, melt. Discomfort, go. Body, be healed. Marriage, be healed. Career, be healed. Situation, be healed. Business, be healed. Receive it in the name of Jesus. What cannot be found in Christ cannot be found in you. I decree by the finished work of Christ, reign in life. Reign in life. Reign in life. Give them praise and shout and celebrate. Oh, glory. Glory. I said glory. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. It's been an adventure together, studying and learning the things that Christ will have us do to a generation that don't know him. I believe that the word of God has blessed you and challenged you today. I want to encourage you. We have a mentoring academy where we can take time to equip you some more. So if you're looking to study further with me, I will encourage you to email me today to join my mentoring academy. Let me also mention if you live in a place where there's no Bible teaching church where Christ is revealed, a church where you can learn the things you're learning from me here, you can start one in your community. You can start one in your locality. And if you want to start one, we can train you, equip you, and work with you until a campus, that's what we call our churches, a campus is launched in your community. You're not learning all of these truths to just sit down somewhere. You're learning them so you can also teach others. Brother Paul said to Timothy, the things you have learned and heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who shall in turn commit to others. Everything you're learning, is so that you can also be a blessing to other people. Remember, blessed to be a blessing. So if you want to start a campus today or you want to join one, send me an email, drabeldamina at yahoo.com. We love you. Remember, we are live every day, 12 noon GMT plus one, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. GMT plus one. You don't want to miss what God is doing at this season equipping and preparing people that will take this gospel to the ends of the earth. We love you and look forward to hearing from you. And until we connect in the next broadcast, enjoy the grace of Christ. Amen. Oh.